morning. Welcome to Prototyping to Production, bridging the gap with the common tool. You made it to the final day of I.O. 2017, and we hope you've been enjoying your time here. My name is Fiona Young, and I'm an interaction designer on the material design team. Hi, everybody. I'm David Yang. I'm a UX engineer, and I work with Fiona. In my world as a designer, I aim to give users the best, most delightful experience with any product I'm designing. I create meaningful interactions that are easy yet exciting that help get the user to their end goal in as few steps as possible. Behind the screens, I'm constantly in and out of design brainstorm sessions, working closely with a large variety of people. As a UX engineer, I take Fiona's designs, ground them in reality, and implement them in code. So let's imagine we have our weekly stand-up between designers and engineers. Fiona is going to show me some new designs that she's made and stuff that we're trying to implement. Hey, David. Hey, Fiona. How's it going? Good. How are you? Not bad. I wanted to show you this new Kangaroo's Art Safari Valley card I designed. Uh, the design looks pretty good. I, I wouldn't call it a card, though. To me, it's more like a box with three pixel border radius, a light black box shadow, and a gray background. It's, it's a really simple material design card. Well, this is how I'd code it up. Everybody knows code is the truth. Well, you know material design? You should probably read up on it. It's Google's design language. I know, I know. But I'm really busy, and it's summer, and I want to have fun. <laughs> so this, might, this is a perfect microcosm of the gap that's seen often between designers and engineers. We come from two different worlds. We have, a different, we have different backgrounds. And we have different frameworks about thinking about things. So we have the same thing on screen, and we have two different views of it. When designers and engineers meet, sometimes it's hard to get a consensus because of our different backgrounds, perspectives, and priorities. There are times when I'm in a meeting, and I think that everything I'm showing is pretty straightforward, but then I realize that I actually lost the engineers a few slides back. So even though we're working towards a common goal, sometimes it still feels really hard to speak the same language. And because we don't speak the same language, sometimes this leads to misunderstanding. And eventually, misunderstanding could lead to distrust. So you have a lot of friction when you try to get any idea from design to implementation. Everything really feels like an uphill battle. Ultimately, it's the users that lose. Because you lose focus on them, you're not able to iterate as quickly to achieve your end goals. And you might not fully implement the entire design vision. So what's the problem? We're not speaking the same language here. And today, Fiona and I will give you a glimpse of how we try to attack this problem on our team. We leverage a prototyping-centric workflow using the same tool, the Flutter UI framework, across prototyping and our production code in order to bridge this gap. We hope to break down some barriers so that you can leave this talk with a deeper understanding on how to better collaborate with your entire team, ultimately creating a better product, better team culture, and better work efficiency. We'll go over the existing workflow between designers and developers, four mindsets to have to bridge this gap, the power of prototyping, my personal journey to coding, and we'll end it off with a live demo using Flutter. All right, let's dive into the workflow between designers and developers. As you might already know, the design process has several stages. It begins with understanding. First, we have to understand our users. What do they want? What's the current problem? And what's wrong with existing solutions? After we understand this research, we begin to sketch. This is where we generate a ton of different ideas before narrowing it down to a select few for designing. The ideas that actually make it to the design stage are then mocked out from low to high fidelity before prototyping. And prototyping is not only great for developers, but it's great for designers so that we can test and validate our ideas. After several rounds of this, we refine and iterate. So we have really rough wireframes, low fidelity mockups, which are just simple boxes for photos and text placements, and then high fidelity mockups. This is what we want our final designs to look like. Once we get to high fidelity mockups, we create red lines. And this is what we've typically done in the past, but we find that it's not the best way. So red lines, or what we call a spec, 
are basically detailed design document that indicates the type sizes, color swatches, and margin and padding units. And this isn't a great way because if we, if we treat this process like a back and forth handoff, it creates a lot of friction. As a designer, I create the red lines, and it takes a lot of time. And then I hand it off to my developer, and he'll say, you know, this is really hard. I don't think it's feasible. Let's just, let's just switch it up and make it easier. Which means I have to go back to my designs, make some changes, redo the red lines, and it's just over and over again, handing it off to my developer again, and the same thing happening again. Ultimately, these comprehensive red lines are exhaustive both for the designers and developers. As a designer, you have to cover every nook and cranny. So you have some padding here and margin there. And your developer is bound to come back with all these questions. What happens is you end up building a lot of redundant artifacts that are just thrown away in the process. There's another thing. These mockups don't convey the animation, transition, and flow that oftentimes really make a UI pop. So we lose a lot of fidelity through this gap and through this transition. So before we jump into our tool, let's, let's talk about some simple mindsets to keep that start to bridge this gap. The first one is we have to be user focused. And this is important for developers. So developers out there, talk to your designers. Ask them about the use case. Ask them about why you're building this UI and what's the end objective for the user. That way you can understand the overlying goals and have a clear communication with your designers. It also helps to engage together early and often. Designers and developers don't silo each other out. Being on the same page about expectations and goals means that you can still redirect early on. It also helps to treat it less like a handoff and more as a group effort, because ultimately, you'll result in more viable outcomes and less churn. As a bonus, if you involve engineers early on, it means that they're less likely to reject your idea. And it's also important to establish the same building blocks early on so you can build on top of each other. So Fiona and I should agree what a card is and use that from that point on. Designers, you also need to understand technical constraints. We have to know what kind of information we have to work with, the data, the API information, as well as the technical limitations of the framework. In order for this, this helps us prevent us from creating fantasy mocks that we might become too attached to. All right, so we've talked about four different mindsets to bridge this gap. What about a hands-on method to improve this? Well, hopefully a lot of designers out there in the room are already prototyping. And you realize the power of prototype because you're able to convey your design in a more visceral fashion that developers can understand as well. The good news is there's an influx of prototyping tools out there in the marketplace. They're highly expressive. And they make it very easy for designers to create these interactive flows. But we still have one problem. These, these prototyping tools don't use the same language across prototyping to production. So what might be easy to do in your prototyping tool actually might be hard to do in production. And what might be hard to do in your prototyping tool actually might be very easy to do in production. So as a designer, when you're prototyping, you might not understand and explore the full technical constraints of your problem space. Additionally, if Fiona cooks up some prototypes with these tools and gives them to me, I can't just like copy and paste it into my code. So we have the same problem as we had before. I e she either has to make red lines, which we know are exhaustive, or I have to go and eyeball the margins and paddings of these prototypes, which just isn't ideal. So to solve this problem, our team has embraced this UI framework called Flutter. It's an open source UI framework. Both our design and engineering team uses Flutter for our prototypes and our production code. What's great about Flutter is that it allows for rapid scaffolding. You can design fully for your intent for both iOS and Android platforms. Our goal is to make it easy for you to go beyond the limitations of stock toolkits. And Flutter does this by having composable components. It's also built in with a rich set of widgets, like iOS and mature design guidelines, like the card and the grid list that you're already familiar with. Also, Flutter has an app 
a gallery app for you to explore the different widgets that are already pre-built for you to explore. But that's not all. Flutter gives you the freedom to be unique. You can design fully for, both your, for your intent for both iOS and Android platform. And Flutter does this by giving you composable components and the ability to code with a single code base. Design once, code once, ship it to all. And hopefully, it's, as a designer, you realize it's important to test your designs in the real world. So what does it mean to be real? Well, you want to hook your designs up to real data, try to give it to real users, and go through real, real workflows. Because Flutter is one tool that can span from design prototypes to production, it can carry you through this process. It has all the developer goodies that we need, such as automated UI testing framework and IDE support. The cool thing is teams both inside and outside of Google are shipping apps today on iOS and Android using Flutter. Everything David said sounds pretty good, but as a designer, the thought of coding is still really overwhelming and scary. Let me walk you through my personal journey of learning how to code. So prior to learning Flutter a few months ago, I never really touched much code. I had a few HTML and CSS classes back in school, but that was pretty much it. I couldn't really get myself past the long lines of text. And to be honest, whenever I did think of coding, I thought of the matrix, which is really confusing and just not accurate. But luckily, I had a really supportive team. Our engineering team wanted our designers to come in and take some ownership over the small things, such as margins, padding, and color. And so we actually held a series of workshops to teach our designers Flutter. Instead of focusing on the intricacies of code, such as syntax and inheritance, we just really focused on the building blocks that designers would need to create common UI patterns. So my first experience with Flutter actually didn't involve any technical coding at all. I simply learned drawing boxes representing columns and rows, which are some of the building blocks of Flutter. So I learned that when objects are stacked, it's in a column. And when they're side by side, it's wrapped inside a row, just like this. And then I also learned that you can wrap rows inside a column as its children, and vice versa. So my first time actually creating a mock-up prototype was for this simple recipe mock-up. So on the left, we have recipe information. And on the right, we have an image. So these two things are side by side. So that's how I knew it belonged inside a row. Diving deeper into the recipe component, there's the title, description, ratings. And because ratings has the icons on the left and reviews on the right, it meant that it was side by side. So this was going to be a row inside this column. And lastly, we have icons. The icons are also side by side, which meant that they were going to be in a row. And all of this, because it's stacked, meant that it was going to be wrapped inside a column. So this was what I did every single time I wanted to code something. And because I was a beginner, it really helped me map out and visualize my designs. And it was a literal one-to-one -one mapping into the code. So I would start with a column. Inside the column were its children. So in this children, I would have a text for title, description, a row for the icons, and a row for the ratings. What was awesome was not only was Fiona's exploration and sketches useful for the designers on her team, it was eye-opening for the engineers on our team. They, it gave them a glimpse of the mental model of how a designer approached Flutter and how, how a designer approached UI layout. They were really energized by this. And in response, they actually created a tutorial, which is entirely based off of Fiona's work. And this is all live on the Flutter website. Another one of our designers came from a web prototyping world. So he was used to using HTML and CSS. In order to help him along the process, he created a series of cheat sheets that map HTML code to Flutter code to, to map these concepts. And just like before, in response, the Flutter team found this really insightful. And they published a full-fledged tutorial basically taking the cheat sheets and showing helping web developers or web prototypers move from the web to Flutter. What this really shows is it shows the collaborative power of being on the same language and using the same framework across engineering and design.
Because of this, we're able to have these serendipitous collaborations such as this, which produces artifacts that are useful for everybody. So what really helped me was to create flashcards and guides, things that resonated with how I understood these concepts. I also asked for help a lot among my team. And also, I used Stack Overflow, which is a Q&A site for coding topics. And lastly, just keep practicing. And remember, you're not trying to become a developer. There's still a ton of technical things that I don't understand myself, but that's not the, part, that's not the most important part. This is just bridging the gap between you and the developers. All right, so we finished talking about the problems and some solutions. Let's dive into our uh, prototype. Today, we'll show you how we use the Flutter UI framework to create this music mockup. And we'll focus specifically on this featured artist card. All right, let's jump to the code. All right. So what we have here is IntelliJ. And IntelliJ is Flutter's fully officially supported IDE. So you're going to see some, some nice things in here. As I mentioned before, or as we mentioned before, Flutter is built on top of these composable components. We call them widgets. So typically, you'll use simple widgets, such as text, images, icons, rows, columns, compose them together to form more complicated widgets that ultimately re result in your end UI. And what Fiona is going to do is she's going to use these basic widgets to code up the concerts mock that you just saw. So from my mockup, we begin with the card. So really simple. I'm just going to type in card. And then inside here, we have a new column, which is the stack of items. And so here we see something really awesome. All Fiona needs to do is type in card. And she gets a material design card with all the padding, shadows, and, and background. So it starts to show that Flutter is designed to be easily scaffolded for your common designs. And because of that, we could speak the same language. Now we both understand what a card is, because a card is in the code. So the first part of this card is a photo. I've already pre-coded this part, and I'll just paste it right in here. OK, I'm going to remove the commenting. And check this part out. Flutter uses the Dart language. And because of that, we get all the developer tools from Dart. Fiona is actually using Dart format here to make her, her code all line up. And this is extremely powerful as a designer, because you, you don't want to focus on tabs versus spaces or alignment. So with the click of a button, her code is formatted. And it eases the communication between me and Fiona, because this is just something that we don't have to worry about anymore. And because I'm a designer, I really like to visualize things. Just looking at the code doesn't tell me what I've actually done. So one of my favorite things about Flutter is the hot reload tool. So there's a little lightning icon here. With the click of a button, I can instantly see what I've created, which is this photo. I also can see that there's no margins or paddings. So let's go in and add that. And this part makes you smile as a developer. Because what Fiona is doing, she's taking ownership of the small design details that she cares about. So she's setting the margins. And because she, she wrote this code, if later on she decides the margins don't look right, she can easily go back and tweak them without having to talk to me. All right, so with the click of a button, now there's margins, the spacing around the photo. Next up in this card, we have the non sharpened text. So again, I pre-coded this part, and then we're just going to paste it right under the photo. So it's all wrapped inside the children. OK, auto form format, and then hot reload, and now we have the text. So everything was almost ready, except we don't have the styling. So let's go in and add that here. Flutter has these objects called themes and text themes. They allow you to enforce a consistent style throughout your app, which is very powerful for designers. And because Flutter wants it, Flutter's designed to be easy to make beautiful apps, it comes with material design, and iOS themes all built in. So terms such as headline and body2 are all really familiar to Fiona. So again, we could start speaking the same language, and we're on the same page. All right, so I've added the text styling. Now we're just missing the purchase button. Let's go in and add that. So right now I'm using a raise button, which is right out of the material design guidelines. And let's see what it looks like. OK, we have a simple gray button right now. And if I click on it, 
There's already a ripple effect. And this is all built in, so I don't have to do anything. And because I'm the one who designed this design, I, can, I know that I want to use a shopping cart, and I know I want the button to be pink and the icon to be white. So let's add that. What's also really cool is that when I type icons, I see a list of built-in material design icons already. So it's not hard to just insert whatever I need. I know that I need the shopping cart, so let's add that. And same with colors. I want white. And I want the bun to be pink. OK, let's double check. There. Now the bun is exactly how I want it. And also, if you notice on the left-hand column, we have a box for pink, white, and the shopping icon. So they're just more visual indicators of different things that I've used. How's this it look, David? Pretty good. Well, actually, now that I look at it, there's just one small issue. What's that? Well, according to material.io, when you have a card, you always want to use a flat button instead of a raised button. All right, David caught me. So apparently, you can't use raised buttons on the material design card. So I can really easily swap this out. So instead of a raised button here, I can use a flat button. And just like that, the shadows are now gone. And if I want to change it for an iOS version, I can easily do that right here as well. Okay. And there's just a red box here to show that it's an overflow. But that's OK, because we're going to stick to the flat button today. Okay. Now the button is exactly how you want. But there's one last problem. The spacing with the text is really close together right now. What can I do about that? I would actually use the visual debugger in this situation. What the visual debugger does is it shows you how margins, padding, and alignment are used to determine your final layout. So what we have here is we see that the band name, non-sharpen, is getting squished by our button. And we really want to have that text space out for that entire row. So we push our button flush right. OK. So that means I need to use an expanded widget. So right here, expanded. I'm going to wrap this column inside. So this column is what the text is. So I'll just put it here. And voila. The first part of the, the card is done. Now I'm going to hand off my code directly to David, and he'll be able to build right off of it using exactly what I've created. And hopefully you saw kind of the, the power of having a really great IDE and, and having a framework, Flutter, that is designed to be design friendly. And so it was really easy for Fiona to add her, her icons and buttons and change things. OK, so now I'm going to I'm going to check out Fiona's code. So she gave me some files, and I'm going to check that out. Oops, let's try that again. OK. Let's give it a run and see what it looks like. So Fiona has actually gone in and head and created out the Venues Details section, which is on the bottom right here. So it shows that we're going to this non sharpened concert at McKillop's Bar. Cool. Now let's take a look at the code. So I've, I've gone in and head and started making the code a little bit more production ready. So I extracted out her UI into this, into this widget called the Artist Card, which specifically represents this entire card. As you have seen, maybe in Fiona's code, things started to get a little bit long. We were nesting a lot of things inside columns, inside rows, inside columns. So in order to make this a little bit cleaner and semantic, I built these helper functions. So we have the build header function, which just builds the widget that represents this top section. And then we have the build venue details function, which just builds this bottom part right here. And finally, we put these two functions inside a column. So again, it shows that everything is really composable in Flutter. They're just functions. What's really important for our workflow is the fact that I have only moved around Fiona's code. I didn't really change it at all. So these, this is still Fiona's code. Oops. And she can go back and make changes if she wants to. So Fiona, wh what do we want today? What are we so looking at? When I at? tap on non-sharpen, I want the venue details to close or expand whenever I tap on it. OK, cool. So we want this card to be toggable so we can expand and close um, the venue section. First, I'm going to make a Boolean flag, which is my state. And 
This will tell me when to open the card and close the card. By default, we'll make the card closed. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to want to animate this opening and closing. Flutter has a widget built in called the animated crossfade. Now, what this does is it animates between two widgets. So my first widget will be the venue section. So I'm just going to copy and paste this venue details function, plop it in my first child. And then because I'm, I'm opening and closing this card, my second child is just going to be empty complaint container. So I'm animating from something to nothing. Finally, I have to specify, based on my state, when to show the venue details section and when to hide it. So when open is true, we'll show the first, we'll show the first uh, widget. Let's see. And when open is false, we'll show the second widget, which is the empty container. All right, great. Finally, we want to specify a duration for this animation. Right now, I'm just going to eyeball it, maybe make it 400 milliseconds. But the cool part is, because Fiona and I are using the same code base, we're using the same language, if Fiona thinks this doesn't look good, she can go back and tweak it. So I'm not too worried here. All right, let's see what it looks like. So what we have is we have the, card, the, the venue section details is, is hidden. And that's because by default, I set open to false. Now I actually want to hook up a user action to toggle this state. Again, because Flutter has a lot of material design widgets built in, it makes it easy to, to make this look nice. I'm going to use a widget called the inkwell. What the inkwell does is it shows a material design ripple every time a user presses on that section. And now I could perform an action based on that touch. So we're going to move all the content of the card inside that inkwell. Give it an on tap callback. And let's see what we get. Oops. We have an error. That's fine, because I put it in the wrong place. Let's put it right here. There we go. There we go. So when I tap it, I get my material design ripple. Finally, I need to hook up that action to change the state. In this case, it's pretty simple. I just set. I just toggle my Boolean value. So open will be toggled. All right. Nice. We get this nice animation. And it looks pretty good to me. It looks pretty good, but there's one thing. What's that? It's a bit too slow. Oh, yeah. Go ahead and change it. So because I'm familiar with this now, I can just go right ahead and change it. So let's try 200 milliseconds. OK, that's a little better. Yeah, great. All right, can we switch it back to the slides, please? So hopefully this gave you a little snippet of the advantages of working within the same language, using the same tool from prototyping to production. We're able to jump in, collaborate, and I think we have a better working relationship now. All right, so let's take a look at some key takeaways from our talk today. One of the reoccurring themes that we've been talking about is to embrace the same language. Embracing the same language allows you to actually be able to communicate with each other with fewer misunderstandings, and you're able to work better together, creating a more user-centered product. And ultimately, you also become more empathetic towards each other. Hopefully you've seen it's really a two-way street. It's a group effort. So designers need to take the jump, dive into some code, and learn some of these technical tools. But on the flip side, the developers need to embrace design and also help their designers come to this world of coding. It's not easy and requires, and as you've seen, our team has held these workshops to get this going. And it's pretty apparent that it's a process. So to be honest, it took a lot of upfront effort for our team to get this through. It, it took a lot of work and workshops. But I think, and we think, that this work is, is well paid in the long run. And it's going to benefit your team. You're going to iterate quicker. 
your designers and developers are really going to collaborate and like working with each other. And lastly, we can't stress enough, but aim to use a common tool. So in our team, we use Flutter. But lots of things work for you. As long as you use this common tool, it helps you break down these walls between you and the developer or designer and bridges the gap between you guys. So hopefully you saw the problem. We're not speaking the same language. And you had a glimpse of how we tried to approach this in our team. The really cool part is all that code that we showed you and that mock-up, that was all a real project in our team. And that stuff's all been committed in our repos. So it's a, a real example. Finally, if, if the tool we use, Flutter, really interests you, I would recommend going to this talk at 10.30 by our coworkers, Emily and Emily. This is a more technical talk. And they're going to build an app full out in front of you for iOS and Android on the same time, hooked up live to Firebase. And the best part is that because we're Google, this app's going to be a chat app. <laughs> All right. So if you need more available resources, we have a lot online, flutter.io, materialdesign.io. And don't forget to subscribe to the Google Design Newsletter. Thank you. And I'll <laughs> <laughs> One last thing. Yeah. And if you're interested, if you had more questions about Flutter and our workflow, we'll be out there in the patio answering questions. And we'll also be giving out some Flutter swag. So hopefully, we'll see you guys later. Bye. Thanks. <laughs>